Welcome to Shifted Ed Podcast. This is episode number 18. Today I welcomed Peter Littledahl from his West Coast home, uh, the author of Building Thinking Classrooms in Mathematics. He was uh, had a little bit of time in between PD sessions uh, to come and talk a little bit about his book and about using his book to create a thinking classroom. I hope you enjoy it. So um, I often ask teachers their earliest memories of school, right? When they started going to school and some of their earliest memories. What are some of yours? So, so I immigrated to Canada when I was eight years old. And when you put a line in your life like that, you have very clear memories of events that happened before and after that. So when I was in Sweden, um, I went to grade one. So in Sweden, they, and like in much of Europe, they start later. So I went to grade one in Sweden and I have very clear memories of that. Um, and then I went, when I came to Canada, I went to grade, well, they put me in grade two to start with and then they moved me to grade three. So my memories from grade one are, <laughs> So, yeah, this is going to sound tragic, but my memories of mathematics was we were given this notebook and it was a it was a graph paper. Mm -hmm. And I remember we had to open this notebook and we had to fill every cell on page one with the number one. So we had to learn how to draw, write the number one. And we had to do this in every cell on the graph paper. And when we were done, we turned the page and we did twos. And, and this, was, this was my memory of mathematics in, in uh, grade one in Sweden. Not, I'm not saying that that's what their curriculum looks like now. And I'm not saying that's what their curriculum looked like then. But, you know, from... For people of a certain age, we do remember that time when we were actually mechanically going through the process of learning how to create characters, how to draw the letters, how to learn cursive writing, and so on and so forth. Um, and then we moved on to the more, the, the, the arithmetic, let's call it. And uh, I was very good. Um, and I remember figuring out multiplication on my own. Like it wasn't something they taught in grade one, but I figured it out. And um, I think I figured it out largely because of the language around it. Right. The language, like in, in English, we say three times four, which means we're going to take four three times. Um, this language is similar in Swedish, but just a little bit more clear. Mm -hmm. um, it's more like we're going to do three repeats, repeat four. Okay. In, in, in a way, or four repeated three times. Um, moved to Canada. They st because of my, my, I've been in grade one, so they put me in grade two. And um, I was in a grade two classroom for a week. And then the principal and somebody else who I don't know came in. And I remember them standing over my desk while I sat in this class, you know, I'm trying to fit in and they gave me a test. And I remember what the test was. They would show me pictures and then I had to tell them what the picture was, but I didn't speak English. <laughs> um, so they showed me a picture mm. of a comb and now I'm supposed to communicate that I know what that is. <laughs> right. And I don't know the word for comb. And like in hindsight, from where I sit now, I think back on this test and they showed me these cards. And of course, I recognized what everything was, but I didn't know how to tell them what it was. But somehow I passed the test. They emptied out my desk and they marched me across the field to the annex where there was a grade three classroom. Um, mm. And so I got promoted to grade three because I passed this test. In hindsight, I think what happened was that they really just needed to reshuffle numbers. And they, so that, that's, that's my memory. Um, that's interesting. And, then in, and then that year, my first year of school, math was the only subject that I was allowed to stay in the classroom for. Hmm. So these were, that was back in the day where I had to go to the ESL room. That was the acronym back then. I would go to the ESL room. Um, 
which was literally this little tiny room. And there was two kids in the whole school that were ESL students. And we would work with this one teacher doing endless worksheets on punctuation and grammar. But math was the only subject I got to stay in the classroom for. So I really, I think I was good at math to begin with. I think that really cemented my relationship with mathematics. Uh, it, it was something that I was allowed to be the same as other kids with. Right, right. What about, what does your research tell you about the those early levels of introducing numeracy to kids? Like, when when do you think that should start? Um, and 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 well, what context? I mean, obviously, it's not going to be the same context as as an elementary, like grade one, two, or three. I'm kind of talking like preschool. Like, what does the research inform us about of how to get those kids going with numeracy? So, okay, first of all, I'm no expert in this, right? I am not an expert um, in early learning. I don't read that research. I don't do that research. Okay. Uh, I've ha I have three kids, so I've gone through this. Mm -hmm. You know, I've gone through it myself, but I don't remember those early, early days. Um, second of all, um, I think we have to be a little bit more careful about how we define numeracy. So numeracy and mathematical literacy is generally defined in Canada and around the world as how we apply mathematics in context. So, and context is often perceived as real world. and but I think what you're talking about is how do we start engaging students with number and number mm -hmm. sense and, yeah. and, and getting them exposed to these ideas. And, and I can tell you this. Um, so my personal experience is that very young children know the numbers up to their age plus one. And when I say that they know the numbers of, uh, up to their age plus one, I'm not talking about the chant. Right. So there are there are distinct ways to understand numbers. There is number as quantity, which requires a one to one relationship, being able to to correlate five objects with the understanding that fiveness is invariant if we are looking at five jelly beans or five hot rods. Right. Like it's <clears throat> it doesn't really matter what it is, but fiveness as a concept of quantity. Then there's five, the symbol five then there's five as the ordinal position of five in the chant hmm. that we say one one when we count one to ten and then which is strongly related to five as a position on the number line now these are all very distinct understandings of the number five which is something that someone who is teaching high school has a really tough time understanding that there is that something as simple as a number five actually can be broken down into little pieces of quantity cart like that we call that cardinality uh positionality and symbolic representation and what's interesting is how those three things take a long time for kids to coordinate hmm. it really does um one-to-one -one correspondence is hard for kids the chant and then the symbols, because these symbols are arbitrary. There is nothing five-ish about the number five. You know, we are so familiar with it now that we see them as synonymous, but for a young child, they're not. So right. how early should kids start engaging with this? I think it's like anything else. They 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 should be playing with it. I think it's very natural for, for young, young children to engage with numbers up to their age, because that's something that's really important to them. Mm -hmm. So up to their age, and they usually know their age plus one. And sometimes if we try to push too hard against that, they're not developmentally ready. That's very Piagetian, but I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, um, I think we should start engaging them with number, but not have this expectation that they should get algorithmic and not, and come to the realization that it's harder than you think. Right. Right. It's harder than you think. And this, and anyone who teaches primary knows this. That like, mm -hmm. like if you watch sport, every sport has a move in it that looks incredibly easy and is incredibly hard to learn, right? For the athlete. The thing that exists in early mathematics that is that is the, the idea of counting on. Counting on, moving a child from recounting. Now, this is when they've already mastered this one-to-one -one correspondence, but moving them 
as addition from recounting everything to counting on is a massive move for kids to make. Right. And, and we just have to be sensitive to these ideas that it takes time for these concepts to develop and play with numbers are really powerful ways for kids to start to develop that. Right. I, I think that's informed too some of your, your research that you're doing now with your ele the elementary and high schools where you have this playful element that has to be a part of it uh, to create that engagement or that hook for kids. Is that, could you elaborate on the playfulness of your yeah. 14 kind of points that you look at in your, in your book? Right. So if we're talking about building thinking classrooms, the goal was not to create a playful environment. The goal was to create an environment that was thinking. But if you if you look at it in hindsight, of course, there's an element of playfulness to it. I think I think what overlaps with play is this idea of informal meaning making. Right. So that the students are working collaboratively. They're trying to make meaning together without formal structures and so on necessarily in impinging on them. Um, and it's that meaning, that collaborative meaning making where there isn't someone who is, let's call it the, the, the knower, who, who is sort of just sharing knowledge. It's that they're constructing understanding together. They're making meaning. And I, and I'm, the more I watch thinking classrooms work, the more I am convinced that the absolute best way for students to learn is to make meaning with other students who are also making meaning. And I think that is, from an outside perspective, might look like playfulness, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you watch very young children play, that's what's happening constantly, right? They're making meaning together. They are negotiating roles, negotiating uh, rules. They're inventing rules, inventing ideas. They're, they're using their imagination. They're sharing ideas constantly. And there is that that collaborative meaning making that's happening in play as well. So I, I would say that though, that's probably where the two things are overlapping. You know, there's also an element of playfulness in that the kids are standing up and working at whiteboards and and mm -hmm. and and that we're decentering the teacher, right? So and 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 this is I think one of the things that differentiates playfulness often the perception of play. And there's a very specific um, research based. Uh, engagement with that idea of play, and I'm not an expert on that either. But there is certainly something that juxtaposes play with with teaching, which which seems to be the central role of the teacher. Right. And you remove that central role of the teacher, like we do in a thinking classroom. And that's not to say that they're not vital, but that we're not centering them anymore. And and I guess what's left over can look more like play because we've taken away that that central figure of the teacher. Right. Right. So if, if you're looking at teachers, math teachers of, I love the quote that you say, I do, we do, you do, right? Like, as how our classrooms kind of right. tend to be, tend yeah. to be. What's that shifting role of the teacher? So if I am a, a, a math teacher, you know, elementary or secondary, I think they, they follow a same, similar structure. How does my role change if I'm engaging more in a thinking classroom? Okay, yeah. So, you know, there is this, this adage of, you know, we're moving from the stage on the stage to the guide on the side. And that's, that's been, a, that's, that idea has existed for decades now. Uh, this idea of a student-centered classroom has to, has to, by necessity, remove the teacher as the center, which we were just talking about. But what is the role of a teacher in a thinking classroom versus what is the role of a teacher in a more normative classroom where where their pedagogy is driven by I do we do you do so in, in that setting there the role of the teacher is to construct the lesson and they're going to construct the lesson and they're going to deliver the lesson that's the I do portion right I'm going to demonstrate how to do something and then I will um, orchestrate the part where we do something together, and then I will assign you to do some work on your own. And the role of the teacher does not end at that point. Now the role of the teacher becomes more individualized as they work the room, uh, doing a number of different things, keeping kids on task, managing behavior, 
And then also individualizing instruction as you're helping individual students who are who may be struggling with a particular concept. But that's sort of, I would say, the role of the teacher in an I do, we do, you do environment. And I don't want to minimize the time and effort it takes to prepare for that. Right. Um, in a thinking classroom, we still have to prepare the lesson. Mm -hmm. Right. We still have to think about what is going to be the first encounter students are going to have. We have to construct the sequence of encounters that they're going to have. What are the tasks that these students are going to engage with? There might have to be some information that is transmitted to them right at the beginning, but we have very limited time, five minutes. So mm -hmm. thinking about how I can strip away as much as possible from what it is I need to share with them to its basic core element so that I can get them thinking as soon as possible. So I still have to do all this preparatory work, um, but then I have to kick into, into a mode that I call working the room, which is I now have to be in the moment responsive. When a group finishes a task, I have to be ready to give them the next task. When a group needs a hint, I have to be ready to give them a hint. I have to work at mobilizing knowledge in the room so that all these individual groups who are working as groups are, I'm trying to also get the knowledge flowing between the groups. Um, and I have to maintain all of that. And that's that's when we first start working as a thinking classroom teacher. That is how we perceive our role, right? Which is prepare the sequence, minimum instruction, get them going and thinking, and now manage the engagement by, through hints and extensions. Um, as we get further into the practice, there are more nuances that start to emerge, one of which is as we're trying to maintain that engagement, we're also planning for the consolidation, which requires us to, to um, be doing a lot of in the moment planning with the work that's presenting itself around us. So starting to think about how I'm gonna utilize the work that students are presenting to weave together a cohesive narrative that, that can be used in the consolidation. Um, I may also be doing some formative assessment. Well, we're always doing formative assessment, but I might actually be doing some assessment where I'm targeting very specific children, very specific students, and trying to ascertain what it is that they know and what they can demonstrate. And so the work of a thinking classroom teacher, I think, is very is really about being very responsive. It's you're always working with with what's in front of you in the moment, right? It's much more. Uh, immediate. Whereas when we think about teaching in more normative ways, there is a transmission, there is some formative assessment when the students are working independently, but really almost everything else happens asynchronously in the sense that I'm now going to collect work and I'm going to mark it and I'm going to do that uh, outside of the student activity and so on and so forth. So there are some key differences, uh, massive differences, I would say, but it still yeah. requires the full teacherly craft of the educator. Like we still need all that craft that we've spent decades developing. We still need our ability to read the room and to work with the various personalities, manage behavior, manage engagement. Um, and and we, we, we need all those things in order to make right. it work. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Do you, when you think about teachers and, and, if they will have success in a thinking classroom, what are the what are the qualities of a teacher that needs to they need to have to be able to find that orchestration, find that fine dance that they do with the students, where they're not giving too much to the student, they're allowing struggle to happen, they're allowing thinking to happen. What kind of teacher qualities come out of the teacher when they're kind of in that? And, and is there teachers that just can't get to that stage ever? Huh. Um, so I get asked this question a fair bit about what I think are the qualities of a good teacher. And in general, I always say the same thing. The qualities of a good teacher are, number one, willing to be fallible in front of your students. So mm -hmm. that, I think that's the most important quality. And number two, a little bit of eccentricity. Um, mm -hmm. And I think if a teacher has those two qualities, that doesn't mean they're going to be excellent to begin with, but they will be able to become excellent. Because if you're willing to be fallible in front of your students, you have all the courage it takes to try things. And if you have a little bit of eccentricity, then you don't have too much pride. 
right? You're 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 willing to be again this fallible, but you're willing to be clumsy and so on and so forth, because that's how we become a good teacher. We become a good teacher. We have 200 days a year to practice this. Times however many years we're going to be a teacher. If we use each one of those days to work on our practice, we're going to become exceptional teachers, but we're going to have to make a lot of mistakes and we're going to have to make mistakes in front of the kids to do that. So those in general, I believe, are the two best qualities that a teacher could have. Right, right. Now, how do they? How do we take this fallible, eccentric person and have them become an exceptional teacher in a thinking classroom? Yeah, they're going to have to work on holding back a little bit. Our, our instinct is to be, to help, to save, to rescue. And right. we're gonna to have to resist that. We're, our, our instinct is also to answer questions. We're gonna to have to resist that, right? And, and we, we're going to have to work on these little nuances around that. We're gonna to have to get comfortable with the chaos because it's noisy and it's chaotic. We're gonna to have to start accepting the fact that the classroom that is best for learning isn't necessarily the, the space that is most comfortable for me to work in, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a whole bunch of things that we got to come to grips with. But I think if we start off with those two qualities, I think we can get there. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's hard for teachers to be vulnerable in the sense of showing that they might not know something. I remember like my schooling, and I've been in education my whole life, that teachers rarely want to show you that I'm not really sure. <laughs> like there's, it's, it's like kind of like, Oh, well, maybe I don't know. Maybe I'm not a good teacher. Right. Like it's that kind of reflect that instinctual kind of reaction to it. Um, and trying to curtail that because in the end you want students to make mistakes as well. Right. In a thinking yeah. classroom. I mean, I, I always tell kids in that I'm doing maker spaces with that. If you're not making mistakes, you're not learning. Right. And we have to do the same thing as a teacher. It's just we have to do it in front of our students. But I can promise you this. For anyone who's listening to this, I can promise you this. They're not talking about it at the dinner table. Right. right. The only person who thinks about these, these mistakes we make are you on your drive home. And that's good. We reflect on that. But I can tell you that your students are not sitting at home talking about it at, at dinner. And, and we have... We have actual evidence of this because we'd go into a, a classroom, we'd screw something up. The kids would come back and we'd say, okay, that didn't go so well yesterday. We're going to try again. And the kids are like, what are you talking about? They had no <laughs> clue, right? Like we're the only ones who have the metrics to decide whether something goes well or not. Right? Right. They're the ones yeah. for them. It's all just learning and, and experience. Yeah, absolutely. I love it too that it's competency based too that you're looking for mastery not mimicry. I mean that's another some something that I've heard you say before. Um what does competency mean? Cuz oftentimes I talk with teachers and they're like competencies yeah is there a percentage to it? I'm like no. Like well what does a one mean? What does a two mean? Like what's your what's your definition of a competency based classroom? So <clears throat> first of all the noise in the system is exactly what you said. It's when we start trying to evaluate it, right? That's when it gets difficult. But I think the simplest way for me to def definish, define or distinguish competency from content, and that's the exact language we use in BC. Our curriculum is broken into two pieces. We have the competency side and we have the content side. And the way I distinguish between the two is that competencies are verbs and content are nouns. And, and for me, that really keeps things really clear. Right. Content is the list of things we want students to learn. Competencies are the, the, the behaviors, the actions, the verbs of, that we want students to acquire and to exhibit in the process of learning the nouns. Right. So reasoning is a verb. It's a competency. And we can work on student reasoning. We can work on their visualizing. We can work on their problem solving. Right. We can work on their persevering, right? We can work on collaborating. These are all competencies. They're all in words, right? And, and we use those to build up. And this is where the tension is. We use those to build up a better student so that they're better at acquiring the nouns. Hmm. But the irony of all this is when they leave our classroom, the thing that they really take with them are the competencies, right? Like the, the nouns, they're just context for us to engage in being mathematical, right? It's 
and we forget that we forget that almost yeah. all of the the stuff we teach serves only as prerequisite knowledge for the next course but eventually that next course doesn't happen and that all that prerequisite knowledge just crumbles away right what is it we take with us out into the world what is it that is transformable from education and i'm not just talking about mathematics here but what is it that we take with us as we move from school to life it's competencies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right like exactly. no one's out there and unless you're a history teacher you're not better equipped for the world just because you understand the Japanese feudal system right like that's <laughs> not going to make you a better banker right like it's it's the competencies we acquire absolutely it's it's tough then when we come to evaluation particularly mandated evaluation right because they're looking for a percentage they want to know what you've learned well I'll put that in air quotes um how how do you go about getting kids ready you're developing their competency to think but then in the end the evaluation is a summative evaluation on what you know does that is it is it a struggle for kids that are trained or you know trained in a learning thinking classroom to then have to do a formative exam that's very content based is there so, a right. a disconnect there so first of all we have to accept the fact that no competency is ever going to serve as a handicap uh, except for maybe the competency of critical thinking right mm -hmm. critical thinking is going to make you distrust some things that are going to come at you in the future which which might make you more skeptical of the teaching that you're seeing next year, right? So, and that's not a handicap, but it just, it's going to make you more cynical. Um, sure. But so competencies are not going to make you worse. They're gonna make you better. And they're gonna make you better equipped to handle any sort of summative assessment. Now, it was interesting in your comments because you flipped from talking about a, a standardized external mandated assessment as, as measuring learning to measuring knowing. And I think that's not without irony, right? Hmm. I think we have to accept the fact that all assessments measure something, but none of them measure everything. And we have to really come to grips with what it is it actually measures. So does a provincial exam or a standardized assessment or even a department-driven assessment school district driven assessment does it actually measure learning or does it measure performance mm -hmm. right and are they the same thing right so i think that learning leads to performance but a measure of performance is not an accurate measure of learning right mm -hmm. learning can be way more than what performance is but uh, but that kind of a closed form assessment will only really measure what a student is able to perform not what they've what they've not what they've gone through in the acquisition of that knowledge right not the learning that has been achieved not the 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 complex understandings and the network of of concepts that they have going on in their mind that's what learning is and and we're not going to be able to measure all that um the thing about competencies is because they're verbs, they're actually best assessed through observation because they're actions. And this is one of the big mistakes that we make in assessing, try, trying to assess competencies through written formats. It, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work well mm. because all we're capturing are these this residue of activity. We're not actually capturing the activity. So if you want to measure reasoning, you're going to have to watch a student reason. If you want to measure perseverance, you're going to have to watch a student persevere. And if you want to measure student thinking, you're going to have to watch them think, right? If we try to capture these things through written text, all we get is that residue. And often we don't get, and it's often a very shallow proxy for the actual activity. Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, governments want us in an effort to push us as teachers towards being more competency-based as instructors, want us to start assessing competency as a sort of accountability structure but it's it's difficult right and and i'm not saying that anyone's getting it right right now um there's a lot of ways to get it wrong but it doesn't mean that just because we can't measure it easily it's not worth pursuing and i think that's the, the that's the key and i think ministries of education across canada are going to have to sort of come to grips with this and the reporting mandates that we've always We've always driven teaching and learning 
through what we assess in a written structure, um, we're going to have to rethink that because mm -hmm. we have to find other ways to encourage people to pursue competency-based education than trying to hold a written test over them because everybody knows that it's not going to work. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I listened to a talk you gave where you talked about institutional norms and we've got to, what did you say? You need to break these. <laughs> these are some of the things that we need to start breaking down. Um, is it possible for an individual teacher, an individual school, a school board, are they able to break some of those down? Does it have to happen at the top or can it happen lower down on the chain? So this is this is actually one of the, I, I spent a lot of time doing work in the US right now. And this is actually one of the really big differences I see between how Thinking Classroom gets adopted in Canada and how it gets adopted in the US. Um, in Canada, it by and large gets adopted at the teacher level. So an individual teacher, they've read the book, they become inspired, they've gone to a workshop, maybe it was a whole district wide workshop, but it's the individual teacher who decides whether or not they're going to implement this in the classroom. And I think this is one of the uh, one of the positive byproducts of our of our structure and our union structure and so on and so forth that teachers have professional autonomy. Hmm. In the US, building thinking classrooms is mostly adopted at the school level, at the department level. So there could be individual teachers who go, they bring it back to their school, but, but schools in the US work very much on a teamwork basis. And I, and I feel that when, I, when I'm in the US that they operate as teams. So it's mm -hmm. okay, we're gonna do this as a team. So in the US, I see much more systemic implementation of thinking classrooms. And in Canada, I see much more individualistic implementation. Now, what's interesting is that that individual implementation then creates that groundswell, that sort of infection as it spreads. And then, and then you start to see that bottom up change in institutional structure. Um, whereas in the US, they are inspired at the institutional level, whether that level is at the school level. I work with a lot of district levels. I even work with departments of education where thinking classrooms is being adopted at a state level. So mm -hmm. it's, now, we know that when it moves from the bottom up, it has that sort of, it has better buy-in, but not everyone is going to do it. When it comes from the top down, it, we might remove more barriers and we might create structures that make it more possible for us to implement it. But we also are inherently resistant of things that are pushed on us. So there's almost this sort of, what's interesting is the work I do in the US where I work with individuals who then operationalize it at a structural level. And so you get that sort of best of both worlds and in some cases. But it's, I don't think there's, I'm not gonna say one is better than the other. I just, it's one of the noticings I've made in working in the, yeah. uh, on different sides of the border. Oh, it's fascinating. It's, um, your research is fascinating. This book is fascinating. Like I've done the, the um, book studies with groups with this book and we've had lots of conversations. And these are conversations that we've been having for, I, I don't want to say decades, but decades of how can we start to change things slowly so that kids are thinking more so that when they leave our classrooms, they have the abilities to learn, like they can do it on their own and they don't need a teacher anymore. Um, so I, I, I want to thank you for joining me um, and talking about thinking classroom. I mean, we revolved a lot around the ideas behind the book without talking about the book very much but um i know it's well received and teachers that have taken your training have told me that they feel like they are new teachers that they see they're teaching the math in a completely different way and they say they feel liberated um and free um so as you were saying it can start there it can start at that groundswell and then move its way up and it is happening I, I i know many teachers that are taking the research you've done with this book and applying it which um you've changed a lot of people's lives which i am so happy to be able to have you come and share with uh, my community and whoever else is going to listen to this about these amazing things that you talk about yeah, my pleasure. And thank you for those words. It's to me, that's the greatest compliment that, that a teacher can read my book and it can inspire them to be a different teacher. 
Absolutely. So I'm Absolutely. just happy. I'm just happy to be part of that. Cool. Cool. Well, I wish you a great day. And um, again, thanks so much for taking a little bit of time, I'm sure, out of your busy schedule to um, just have a little chat about math and thinking and students and teachers. Um, it's been really wonderful. And um, thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.